All right, well, I want to welcome everyone today. Thanks for joining us. We have a special guest here, Justin Brennan of the Brennan Poll Group. I will uh, be turning it over to him in just a moment. As usual, Cama Plan does not give any investment advice, tax advice, or legal advice, or investment advice. You know, you should refer to your advisors, accountants, attorneys, et cetera. We're just a part of your team that helps you use your retirement funds to be able to make alternative investments. This is my contact information. I can help anybody that doesn't have an IRA or is looking to do that and go through the ins and outs about using your IRA to make an alternative investments. Pretty straightforward and simple. Uh, my email is rfisher, that's with a C, R-F-I-S-C-H-E-R at camaplan. Dot com. This is a little bit about uh, Justin, and I'll kind of uh, let him say that for a minute, and then I'll turn it over to you, Justin. Uh, you know, it sounds good. Thanks, Ryan. Um, yeah, that's a long introduction there. We got, you don't need to read all that. <laughs> no, no, no. I was just saying, just tell us a little bit about you. They can, they can look at that sure. in the background. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Thanks so much for that. Um, born and raised in San Diego, California. Um, kind of grew up, uh, you know, third generation, son of a, a builder developer in the construction industry, uh, primarily multifamily and then single family subdivisions, uh, digging ditches, kind of learning the groundwork from uh, my father kind of taught us, uh, you know, the value of a dollar and hard work and everything through kind of that grunt labor side of things, which was great uh, in the young age. And then came up through that, uh, got into the multifamily space, uh, primarily out of college, um, started as actually a title rep, uh, then went in and, you know, got my graduate degrees and stuff and got into the development of multifamily. And that was, uh, you know, in the early 2000s, obviously we had the wonderful financial crisis that everybody remembers. That was fun. <laughs> and then uh, started uh, syndicating, which is basically working alongside investors and ourselves with our own money to acquire larger apartment complexes uh, out of state, outside of California, into the Midwest. Uh, currently is where we're at in Texas and Missouri and Oklahoma and Alabama, Arkansas, uh, a little bit of Arizona. We do have some stuff in California and then we're, you know, growing into other markets as well. So um, love it. Enjoy it. It's a, it's a great industry. Obviously, I'm a luxury realtor as well. I have that background as a real estate broker, licensed general contractor. And then uh, obviously on the education side, I have you know, degrees and stuff in that field as well. Great. Thanks, Justin. Um, I also just stopped my share so you can go ahead and uh, say yeah. share. Let's do it. Uh, is he going to do that? There, he's going to share. Justin's working remotely here today. He's at a conference down in Florida. Yeah, quick. Zoom wants to. Yeah, so he's share screen. Yeah, it's going it, to, but the Apple, it's wanting me to approve some security stuff. So it may quit and I may have to reopen it. Just. So you don't freak out. It looks like, hold on. <laughs> no worries. Content to your screen until it's quit. Uh, we can do that later then. That should be fine. As long as it allows me to share it. I know. It's always uh, when you're working remotely and doing things, it's a little different. Got it. Does it allow me to do it now? Uh, yeah. I have uh, your background on with uh, water in the hut. Yeah, it should be. <clears throat> you usually have to select like. Which right. Way. I was just making sure it was allowing me to do it here. So I'll make sure this comes up. Ah, there you okay. go. Yeah, you got it. You're good. Perfect. Um, so I think we, what we want to discuss today, which is kind of on everybody's mind. And, you know, I had to go through this as well. I mean, we, we started with a $100,000 condo, which was our first deal in 2010. Um, $25,000 down payment. $75,000 loan, bought it amidst the financial crisis. And that's how we started. I mean, it started with one and everybody starts with one. So the question becomes, you know, then is it something that you want to do on your own or is it something that you want to invest with other folks uh, that you like and you trust 
that are out there doing obviously bigger deals and you can help scale your money. Um, but if the choice is to do it on your own, I highly recommend it. And then the question is, you know, how do you buy your first rental property? How do you do it? Um, you really need a few things. You know, the first you know, three are the main ones. And that is obviously you need a deal to go after. Then you need the equity, which is either your IRA funds or personal funds, cash, whatever that may be, or somebody else's money as well. And then you need the debt, which is the loan from a banking institution of some sorts. Uh, but then last but not least, once you have all of that and you close on it, you have to be able to operate it, right? And so the operation side is critical uh, to all of that. So no different than when we bought the first property, you know, we had the 25,000. Uh, we got a $75,000 loan from Wells Fargo <coughs> and we bought that first condo and it was cash flowing at that time, obviously at about 13% cash on cash return. You're not going to see that today, but that was then. And then, uh, you know, we operated it. Uh, you know, we started, you know, doing a lot of the property management with my background as a broker on our own internally because we could and, you know, it saved money, number one. But number two, it was hard to find, P, you know, PM companies, property management companies that really could take care of the property the way that we would. And it's hard. I mean, there's not a lot of great property management companies. So we were able to operate it on our own um, successfully and do a good job with that. So that's kind of where the operation side came in. So we had the deal. The opportunity was there as a distressed asset. The equity was our own funds, the debt being with Wells Fargo, and then the operations being our own property management to manage that asset. So then I kind of wanted to, you know, rather than me just kind of sit here and, and talk about it, I think it's important to say, hey, you know, we have the chat. I'd like to have a lot of questions in mind from folks that are maybe looking to do this for yourselves. And you're stuck on one of these areas, right? Whether it's how do I find the deal, right? How do I get the equity? How do I get the debt? How do I operate it myself, right? And all these kind of elements that are in it. So I kind of wanted to open up into the chat and the Q&A. Um, and then, you know, Ryan, you and I can kind of go through some of that stuff to, you know, help folks through this first process of, of owning their first asset. And it could be condo, single family, two to four unit property. That's where most people start. And then they can graduate into larger, you know, type rental properties if they choose. How do you find um, your deals and what's kind of your underwriting process of how you evaluate them? Sure. So in the beginning, to kind of touch back on the first property, uh, at that time we could use the MLS. There was enough properties on there that it made sense. Uh, the market obviously was distressed at that time. So the MLS was our source. Nowadays, it's going to be a combo of on market and off market. So as we're getting into larger assets, which now we're doing 100 unit plus complexes, you know, we're sourcing them both on market and through our off market relationships. I mean, that's part of the reason I'm down here in Orlando, Florida today for the National Multifamily Housing Conference. All the major players are here. All the major brokerages uh, for the commercial brokerages around the country, um, all the major debt sources for banks, all the major equity sources, um, all the major players are here. So it's all of a meet and greet, networking, shaking hands, getting to know people, you know, put a face to, to a name type, type deal. So you can begin to source things and let people know what you're doing. Let them know the markets you're interested in. Um, you know, show them that you, know, you can execute, even if you're small and getting into it. Uh, you, know, you do have partners and people and things that can help you do that. Um, because that's where you're going to start sourcing things both on and off market. And in the commercial space, there tends to be quite a bit more off market deals than even on market. So, but that's how you're going to source them is through the brokers. The brokers are the gatekeepers. Uh, and if it's not the brokers, then you're going through you know, off market channels direct to the owners themselves. And so that's why what's funny is even though there's a bunch of other owners that buy properties like ourselves here, it's great to meet with them too, because they have a portfolio of assets, maybe, you know, a thousand units and 10 different properties around the, the and maybe they're in markets that we're interested in, where we could say, hey, we're looking for this and this and this. They've already purchased the property. They've done what they wanted to do with it. They're coming towards the end of their cycle with the property, typically three to five years, where now maybe they want to sell it. So, hey, I know you, you know me, maybe we could just buy it from you, you know, and not need to go through the brokers as on the on-market stuff. So that connection is important as well. And so that's why when you're here with all these major players, it's very, very, very important to source the deals. Does that make sense? 
Sorry, I was muted there. Uh, okay. Absolutely. Uh, do you focus on certain areas or it doesn't matter? We do. Yeah. So we are in um, primarily kind of Sunbelt Southern states, whether that be Arizona, Texas, Oklahoma. Uh, we do like Missouri, which is kind of, you know, the Midwest and the upper portion. Uh, we are also looking into Florida, uh, Arkansas and Alabama. And those are the current kind of target areas um, for different reasons, right? Primarily it's, it's population growth, job growth, uh, Fortune 500 companies, uh, good logistics for transportation in and out, airports, so forth. Um, path of progress. What I mean by that is redevelopment that's happening, coming, and expansion uh, through that as well. Um, Where they're, they're putting in light rail systems, train systems, transportation infrastructure. Um, and then I think I mentioned university systems. BRAC realignment is another one. It's B R A C, BRAC realignment, which just means base relocations and closures. For the U.S. military. So the U.S. military, they'll typically move bases and assets around the country in 10-year spans. So if you can get an idea as to where the military is moving their assets for the next 10 years or a decade, then you could obviously see, hey, where's some population growth? Where are other companies, private companies going to help support that and so forth? So um, that's why some of the areas we're, we're focused in specifically for that. Um. Great. Uh, another question <clears throat> from Josh, looks like, uh, when calculating an ROI, what is a reasonable target for cash on cash return? Numbers are being squeezed because of value and it's hard to find home runs. Yeah. Great point. Um, so yes, on the ROI, what's a reasonable targeted cash on cash depends on the market you're in. So obviously if you're in a West coast market, that's say San Diego or Los Angeles or San Francisco or some of these West coast markets, um, it's, you know, your cash on cash is going to be tight if any at all. <laughs> so it's just because you're really buying a, an asset for wealth preservation. So it depends on where you're at in your stage. If you are in wealth preservation mode, which means, hey, I'm just trying to not lose money and I'm just trying to preserve my wealth. So I don't need home runs. I don't need growth per se. I just need a stable asset that does produce some cash and I can just sit tight and it's in a market that regardless of market fluctuations, it will come back, it'll stabilize faster and we'll do well over the long haul regardless. So in, in that aspect, you're probably looking at a two to 3% cash on cash in certain kind of Southern California markets, East Coast, New York's, even you know some Florida markets and so forth. As you start to get into the middle of the country, those expectations are gonna get better. And so you're looking at cash on cash, probably you know, once you've stabilized the asset, you know, uh, eight to 10% on a cash on cash basis. Uh, an IRR, which is an internal rate of return, right in the high teens, kind of that 15 to 19% range, depending on, once again, the class of the asset. Um, but like how we do it, how we structure it typically is if we're going into a deal, I definitely want to see high teens on that IRR. I want to see a cash on cash return somewhere in that eight to 10% range by year three, once we're renovated, right? Um, and restabilized as we take an asset that's kind of not operating well, make it better, make it better. By year two or three, we're now stabilized. Once we're stabilized, I want to see that kind of eight to 10% uh, in the Midwest. And I want to see high teens on the internal rate of return. Uh, so that way we can then supply returns to the investors, you know, somewhere in that 18 to 22% range on their money. Um, and then they're getting a preferred return, you know, of 8%. That's all kind of mixed in together. Hope that answers that question a bit. But yes, everything's getting squeezed. You're absolutely right. Values are going up, rents are going up, inflation's going up. It's going to get worse. Um, there's, it's, you know, you're in this kind of funny money stage where we all know there's going to be a correction. It's not a question of if, it's simply when. Uh, we're also in this conundrum where cash is trash, right? I mean, you sit there with money sitting in your savings account. I mean, if you did that in 2021, you lost 6.8% on your money. I mean, congratulations. <laughs> I mean, seriously, you lost 6.8% on your money. And that's just based on 
you know, the Fed's inflation rate, it's really 14 to 15%, but they're obviously showing you a CPI of 6.8. So you're losing money sitting in a savings account. It's completely pointless. Um, you need to get it into tangible assets that comes in many forms, real estate being one of them, you know, bullion, other types of tangible assets outside of the fiat dollar. Because at some point, you know, we know that correction is coming and it's going to deal with currency. Um, you know, so you have to definitely pay attention to that side of it. So I know you kind of focused on people doing their own deals, but don't you um, raise money for some of these deals that you do with the multifamilies? We do. Yeah. And we syndicate. So when I say syndication, meaning we take our money in combination with investors, right? Combine it together and we go buy, say, we just closed on a 121 unit deal in Northwest San Antonio, Texas. Uh, and we're in the process of renovating that asset now. You know, a deal like that typically is producing about a 20% annualized return for an investor based on our projections. Uh, obviously, nothing's guaranteed, right? But that's kind of how we produce it. And that's a combination of cash flow that's produced by the property, as well as the appreciation of the asset over, say, a three to five year time frame as we hold it. So someone can come into an investment like that for fifty to hundred thousand dollars, and then they're getting typically quarterly distributions on that money, and then we're holding it for a period of three to five years, and then we'll typically do kind of a cash out refi event around year three, when we've stabilized it. So that way, a portion of someone's capital is getting returned at that point, and then we're typically holding it for another couple of years. Does that help answer that question? Yeah, no, ab absolutely. That's a, that's a good answer. And, um, and obviously people can do this, whether they're using retirement funds or personal funds with you. Correct. Yeah. They can come in with straight, obviously cash from a bank account. Um, they can come in with IRA funds. They can use a trust. They can use a company an LLC, uh, and invest with us as well. Um, the only thing we're not doing at the moment that we may be doing it not too far is, you know, 1031 exchanges. Um, and allowing folks to to use that method, we're just, that's a little more complicated. We're just not quite there yet. Gotcha. Um, do investors have to be accredited to work with you? Uh, on our recent deal, yes. Although in deals moving forward, uh, we can have a combination of accredited and non-accredited investors, and that'll be done through a five hundred six uh, B offering, B as in boy, uh, through the Reg D filing and the SEC. So that's kind of how the deals are done when you do a syndication is you do an exemption through the SEC for a private filing. It's done through a Reg D is how they call it. And then is the offering type is a 506. And then you can either do a B or C. It's kind of a lot of details here, but a B or C. And that'll distinguish whether you can do accredited investors only or a combination. Understood, understood. Um, another question here. When looking at migration to the Sun Belt as the reason to invest, there is on the flip side, there's assets and markets where people are moving from which are being impacted. How and when could a similar move impact the Sun Belt? Yeah, I mean, it all comes down to jobs. Right. I mean, you, you, you follow jobs and you follow my, my migration patterns typically follow jobs. Uh, and there's a reason for that. You know, we tend to you know, want to invest in, in, in business climates that are fair, <laughs> if that makes sense. So, you know, right now in certain states, um, there's a method of doing things that is, you know, taking one side over the other um, versus just having it be fair across the board for all the folks. And so you're, that's why you're seeing larger businesses move there, tech companies, other businesses, you know, because they're seeing, hey, like there's you know, good population growth, you know, good um, residents there for uh, applying for our jobs and our companies. And we're seeing a, a climate where they actually want to help businesses grow and they're not trying to demonize businesses, Right. Uh, they're, they're beneficial to the entrepreneurial mindset, not demonizing the entrepreneurial mindset, you know, in small businesses, medium businesses, and large businesses. So that's why you're seeing the migration path that way. It's all about jobs. It's jobs, jobs, jobs. And when you're done with jobs, there's more jobs. <laughs> <laughs>
Absolutely. Um, I think that's all the questions at the moment. Um, so I'll let you finish off with anything else you want to say, or is there a tip or anything you've got from being at this conference that uh, you'd want to share? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm excited about 2022. Um, you know, I know everybody's concerned with kind of where things are at economically. Everybody's kind of been on pins and needles as to where the economy's going. Uh, they see inflation, they see all these dynamics and the you know, stock market's going through the roof, all these asset prices going through the roof. And yes, that's very true. Um, and that's because there's a lot of liquidity into the system, a lot of cash into the system. And so asset prices are going to go, 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 go. Um, you know, so that's why you do have to diversify, you know, and I think I'll pull up, I think I can get this up there, but I was going to do, kind of show this. I think this is helpful. It's kind of helped me. This is on our website, you know, why real estate, right? Because there's different assets you can get into, right? Whether that's bonds, you know, REITs, stocks, right? Your equities, your stocks. And then of course you have real estate and you have to diversify into all of these. I'm diversified into all these. And we're even into, you know, the crypto space and the NFTs and the metaverse and all this stuff that that's a whole other kind of, you know, podcast that you could do and webinar, because I think what people need to understand what's coming down the pike is going to absolutely blow your mind. And the more research I do on the metaverse, the NFTs, and the cryptos, and how it's all kind of connecting together, the next two to five years, you're not going to recognize your internet experience the way that you recognize it today, right? The, how we started with Web 1.0, which was AOL, and you know, the, the quintessential logging onto the internet through a phone line that we all know, Right. That was Web 1.0. 1, 1 right. And that was the early 2000s. And then we kind of migrated as, you know, smartphone technology came into play into Web 2.0. And we've been kind of there for the last 10 years as, you know, your desktop screen, which we're on now. And then you got your, your phones. It's still everything's 2D. Right. Everything's 2D. Desktop, phone. What's coming is Web 3.0. And it's going to impact real estate. It's going to impact everything that you're accustomed to in your life today. Because what they're basically doing is they're taking artificial intelligence, AR, which is augmented reality, um, VR, virtual reality, the 5G technology, which is now out there and being launched and pushed hard, in combination with the NFTs, crypto, and then what is now thrown out there to everybody called the metaverse. And you are literally, and I'm not kidding me when I say this, you're literally going to overlay the real world with the internet world because now it's no longer going to be 2D. This internet is coming out of your phone in a 3D environment and it's going to overlay with your everyday walking. And, you know, these oculars that everybody wears and they walk around with these oculars and stuff, All right, those are going to go bye-bye. That's like generation one technology. What's coming is a contact lens you're going to wear in your eye. It's going to overlay the internet and the metaverse with your real world. And I mean, it's, it's going to be wild what's going to happen over the next 10 years. I'm just trying to prep people for what's coming because you definitely need to get in and understand that space because the opportunity is unreal. Like it's, it's beyond anything I can even explain. Um, it'd be like someone coming to you in 2009 and saying, hey, I have this really cool idea. You need to look into this thing. It's like a digital coin thing. Uh, it's called the name of it's Bitcoin. I don't fully understand it, but just go buy as much as you possibly can. Right. And it's 30 cents a share. Right. If someone had that conversation with you, then you're like, you're crazy. Well, look where it's at today. And it's going to get even more. What's coming with all this stuff in combination is going to make that conversation of Bitcoin look like a walk in the park. And so you absolutely need to look at that space, understand it, educate yourself in what's coming because you're going to, we're going to get to a point with this web 3.0 and all the technologies coming in where you're, they're going to literally overlay your real world that we're in right now with this metaverse world that seems full at the moment, but is going to become very real when they have the technology all lined up correctly to where it's, it's going to be like the matrix with the real world. <laughs> crazy crazy what's happening out there. I know it's, it's, and people hear this and they're like, what? I get it. It blew me away um, I, when I first tried to understand it. 
No, that's very interesting information. I'm glad uh, you mentioned that. The simple question, and I'll just let you answer it unless you want me to. Um, so two questions. What is an accredited investor? That's pretty simple. You can say that. And then someone also asked, what conference are you attending? Yeah, so I'm at the National Multifamily Housing Conference. It's the M NMHC conference. Uh, they throw once a year. And it really brings out, like I said, all your major brokerages, uh, equity, debt providers, all the major players, people supporting industries within that. So that's a major industry um, in conference that I'm at. And then there's another one, which is the NAA, which is the National Apartments Association conference. And that'll be in San Diego, actually, this year in mid-June. That'll be another great one to attend if you're kind of interested in that space. Um, this one you have to pay pretty heavily to come to. So you're, you become a member of the council, they call it. And then you can come out, be a part of it. Um, but it's, it's worth it because it's all about shaking hands and, and looking people in the eye and making connections and relationships, uh, which we know and we do it here in January because the rest of the year is, will explode because of it. So uh, accredited investors. Uh, actually, mm -hmm. I'm going to pull it up on our, our website here. So it kind of breaks it down here. Um, simply put, someone has to earn $200,000 a year individually or $300,000, obviously, joint income with your, your spouse uh, or net worth exceeding $1 million uh, or uh, individually or jointly with your spouse, less your personal residence. Okay. Um, however, there's other options on the table, which the SEC considers to be accredited. It lays out in here, whether you're an entity, blah, 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 but I'll kind of leave it there on the website if you want to go to it and you can look. Another one that kind of classifies people if they're not falling in line with some of those is if a person can demonstrate sufficient education or job experience that they've had in kind of this space of, um, uh, of shares, you know, with buying in PP or not private placement memorandums, but with the, uh, the shares of buying in a uh, syndication, then that typically can also qualify them as an accredited investor. Yeah, you can head to our website. We do a lot of Q&A on that as well, um, which is in there for you. Yeah, I think we also have it in our uh, Q&A on our website as well. Um, Perfect. And... Yeah, a lot of people that think they don't qualify as an accredited investor, they find out later they actually do. They just didn't realize it. So, you know, don't let that discourage you. And then we also do non-accredited investors too on certain deals. Um, and people can access kind of our portal and stuff. If people have interest in looking at our deals, what we're doing, what's coming down the pike. Probably going to have four to six opportunities this year in 2022. Um, you know, we're at the point now where we're buying things north of 100 plus units, you know, ideally 150 units plus up into kind of that two, 250 unit space. You know, and these are deals that we're taking down that are, you know, 15 to $30 million deals uh, where we're taking, you know, we're bringing in 30%, you know, equity in combination with our investor friends. And then we'll take down 70 to 75% of that as a, a debt a loan. Awesome. No, that's great. Good stuff coming. Um, I don't see any other questions at the moment. So I want to say, and I know you're, you're busy there and you got to get back to the conference, but uh, I appreciate you spending the time with us, Justin. Look uh, forward to uh, having you back and we will uh, be in touch. Thanks for all the information today. Yeah, you bet, man. I appreciate you having me on and yeah, any questions anybody has, you know, feel free to reach out in any way, shape or form. Um, I think my contact information is there and stuff and, um, you can get in touch with me. So yeah, thanks again. I really appreciate it. Obviously have a great week, everybody. And uh, go fight win. <laughs> my Patriots lost. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell people that here in Philly. <laughs> oh, I know. Well, yeah, it's, it's brutal. There's, I mean, it's all right. And nobody cares about us anymore. I mean, we're, everybody's happy that we're not really in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, appreciate the information. Enjoy the rest of your day. And um, feel free to contact me or Justin if you guys uh, have any other questions. Thanks for joining us today. 
Have a great rest of the day. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Take care.